Hello Richard, how are you doing? To end this episode, I really want to thank Richard so much for joining today. Oh yeah. How do I how do I call the people viewing me viewers? Okay. <laughs> Cut here. <laughs> <laughs> Gunnar, I've just noticed your recording stopped. Is that and it's not gone live anymore? It's nothing's working, you've frozen. Is it anything alright your end? Welcome to a new video and today also a new format. And we're not gonna look at my photos today, we're gonna look at yours. And while I'm here, I will be viewing your photos that you sent in to me. I'm not going to do this alone. So let's well, us all welcome my live guest, live guest today, uh, which is none less than YouTuber and wildlife photographer Richard Burchett from Cornwall, United Kingdom, if I'm not mistaken. Hello, Richard. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Gunnar. Very good. Yeah, good to be here. You've been recently to Scotland and the Isle of Mull. How has your journey been? Yeah, yeah, it's, it was really good. It's quite a long way from where I live, so it, it takes a fair while to get there. But had a great time in the Cairngorms for uh, three weeks and then mulled for a week um, a bit later on. Uh, before I go on asking Richard more about his favorite photo of the season uh, and about his trips, I just wanted to briefly explain to you out there the reasoning behind this format and how it's supposed to work. So. This format has opportunities on both ends, of course, so it has opportunities for you out there to show your work. If big or small, doesn't matter if you're professional uh, or an amateur, it doesn't matter if your camera is really good or if you're using a phone. You can get feedback on your photos, uh, you can be part of the community, and you can learn from others about photography, wildlife, nature and so on while you're sending in your photos. You can leave a story, you can leave some information about the animal, all this combined or techniques and so on for me is basically the same opportunity or uh, for richard out there is the same opportunity to learn something about an animal which is maybe living on another continent where we are not um on that end and for me personally it's uh one opportunity to get to know what people are watching uh, what people are doing that watch my channel this way around and yeah, all photos that you will send in will be marked with the photographers uh, eventually if you send in a name for the photo, which I always think is good to have names for your photos. Um, I will also link the Instagrams, like Instagram accounts or any other accounts that you wish to in the description of this video. And yeah, they will be linked and so you also get your credits set there um, if you want to. So Richard, <laughs> now this small intro. Uh, now this is, goes basically over to you, what kind of photo you want to describe, what kind of experience you want to describe of this spring and tell us a bit about that wildlife that you found there. Yeah, I think um, my favourite one this year was um, up in the Cairngorms. I think uh, mountain hare has always been on my wish list really um, and I went up to, as I said, to the Cairngorms in May, which was spring, um, but when I was there the weather was pretty pretty uh, unpredictable pretty at cold, times. Yes. Yeah, it was pretty cold. So I think mountain hare for me, um, you know, it was a fair hike to get there. I think the mountain hare in its environment, in the snow with a, you know, it was a, a blizzard. Um, I think particularly for me, I think that was one that's most memorable, I think, yeah. um, personally for me, yeah. So yeah, mountain hare in the snow was, was amazing. It's like, yeah, quite extreme weather. That's uh, always a good yeah, experience, I, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's minus, minus 19, you know, wind chill. It was pretty pretty bad for yeah. May, but uh, yeah, amazing. Amazing to be there. What, how is it said? Cairn gro groans. Cairn groans? Cairn gorms. Cairn gorms, yeah. <laughs> I think that it, always when I read it, it's so hard for me to, to say that. Uh, and I'm still not going to try once more. <laughs> but, <laughs> how has the rest of the trip have been? And also the Isle of Mull. What, what has, have you seen? How did you enjoy yeah. it? Yeah, the mole trip was great. Um, I went on my own for a week. Uh, it was a bit of a, a last minute trip plan, but I uh, always wanted to go. It's been on the list. I've never been. Really? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's kind of like the Mecca really for uh, wildlife for us, really. I mean, 340 miles round 
um, concentration of habitats for the species. It's just, you know, species rich with, um, you know, Merlin, Harriers, um, short-eared owls, you've obviously got golden eagles, sea eagles. You know, it's, um, it's, it's one of those places where at home it would take me an awful long time to see a particular species over such a, vi a wide, a wide area. But in Mull, because of yeah. the size of the place and because the, the prime habitats, a lot of species are in there, um, fighting over territories, etc. So, yeah, for me, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I got to see some new species there and also I didn't manage to get to see the otters, but um, I couldn't do it all in, in a week. But uh, it was fantastic. I mean, the scenery, like you said, landscape, photographers, wildlife photographers, you know, it is really the great, great place to be, really. It, it sounds a bit like when I uh, nearly every year, at least for some days, drive to Runde and uh, photograph puffins and everyone knows about the puffins, but actually the landscape is also really pretty. And there are otters as well, but uh, I've, I haven't seen the otters yet. <laughs> but it's, it sounds a bit like yeah, it's no. uh, going in the same direction, but even better. So I'm um, uh, yeah, no. envious looking at, that. The, looking at that. Yeah, the otters were was something I really wanted to see and I did get to see them but just the back end of back end of some and um but I'll, I'll leave that I'll leave that for another time yeah that's that's, that's me looking for moose in this forest and that uh they cross the road and the last thing that I get a photo of is maybe uh their back end yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you gotta you I saw that you now published your last part on your uh, Scotland trip on your YouTube channel yeah, that's right. So yes. I, I did six parts for the Cairngorms, quite a lot really to cover. Um, and I'm doing a three part on Mull. Uh, I mean, that's, that's like something I would do. I would go to one place and then I cut it up into a lot of episodes, depending on how much material I record, of course. But yeah. <laughs> that's how I would do it. Like if you go for a trip like that, I think you can uh, stretch it out to nearly a series. And uh, yeah, yeah. it, it helps a bit to get also a break from YouTube after you've actually been on holiday kind of <laughs> and you filmed all holiday yeah. then to get a break yeah. from youtube after you come home kind of and then just edit i, yeah. I think that's sometimes nice to have that at least once a year because uh, youtube can yeah, be stressing it, out too, quite bit. too much i think you know when you, you are because sometimes as we always say you know it's the youtube bit is great but sometimes you miss opportunities when you're vlogging when you're not actually yeah. in the zone with the wildlife um but you know i suppose it, but I guess in the next weeks we're going to see some Isle of Mole on your channel then. Yeah, I've got one coming out um, on lock, uh, birds on the lock side. Um, it's supposed to be otters, but it wasn't. And then I've got one on the Isle of uh, Lunga for seabirds, puffins, guillemots, razorbills. And then in the final one, uh, hopefully the best one is on shorted owls and hen harriers. So uh, that should be great. Yeah, I'm, well. I'm looking forward to the puffins. I always love to see puffins. Everyone loves to see puffins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're uh, so pleased, but so tame, so habituated to humans. The <laughs> the, the safetyness because of the uh, skewers and stuff. Um, but amazing. So much, yeah. yeah, amazing. After this video, you can all go over to Richard and check out his videos on his Scotland trip, and of course, soon coming videos about puffins, puffins, and the Isle of Mull. But now we come to the essence of this video, uh, which is your photos, and we're gonna review, re <laughs> review them. And the first thing we start off with is was sent in by Sam Knight, and uh, Sam said, sent more than one photo, but I already say I don't show more than two photos that people sent in just to keep it decent a bit. Uh, Sam is from the UK, and do you know the bird that is on this photo, Richard? Yeah, it's a male stone chat. Okay, you directly know that. Okay, because <laughs> I yeah. never seen a stone chat before. I, I probably oh, have, right. but I didn't know. <laughs> I, I don't lovely know. Bird. Lovely. I, I don't know if they they are in Norway. Honestly, um, I know that they exist in Germany, of course, but I wasn't much into wildlife photography when I lived in Germany. So uh, it's <laughs> for me. It's like I never know the names because here people say them in Norwegian. Uh, I know most of them now in English, and I know none in German. And it's uh, in Germany. This is called basically black throat. I think they just call oh, okay. everything after throat. I guess yeah, blue throat, red throat. I just want to let you know what Sam wrote about this photo. He photographed him, him or her, it, the stone chat, <laughs> uh, in early March, and he really liked that it's because this is a really a shot of. 
a bird in landscape, he really liked that he could put it in a context of an overgrown water meadow. And I think that worked really well, if you look at this photo, because, uh, yes, the bird is small on this photo, but it's mistakenly in the focus, and you also have the framing really nicely of the trees here, which, which I really like on this photo. Yeah, I mean, personally, yeah, I do love what he's done there, the diffuse background there, the foreground's a little bit around the edge. Um, and it's quite sim the simplicity of it, really, with a beautiful looking bird in great condition, um, you know, on that on that branch, just sticking up with a nice backdrop there. And it, I think it just really does show the bird off lovely. And I think that's one thing that people do tend to focus on too much these days is the fact that you have to fill the frame with the species. But actually, I think that works tremendously well. Great shot. Yeah, that's, that's sometimes uh, the opportunity when you're out, for example, and you have a lens that is not as long, that you sometimes get better photos with the context to the animal, which is always, I would say it's really important because maybe if, if, if you out there go out and you shoot an animal and you get close and you get your portrait shots, maybe, maybe try to get a bit further away or using another lens to just get the surroundings in. I mean, I don't really have uh, much uh, to what I would say uh, to improve on this photo. Uh, I would have possibly did something about the rule of thirds in arranging the bird sitting somewhere more in the corner or completely centered yeah, yeah. maybe, but that's always open for your own creativity. Um, I'm, I'm the least to say <laughs> maybe what photos are necessarily good or bad, but yes, I, I, I like this photo. I would have maybe cropped it differently. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. maybe, Possibly, but then yeah, on the yeah. other hand, you would maybe not get the same nice framing of the trees. No, I think it's almost like you're looking oh, yeah. through it like a through a tunnel and then you've got it, the center point. Yeah. I think, you know, like a telescope yeah, or something. Okay. I think it's kind of nice. I mean, it, I think it I think it does the bird justice. So, so much about the stone shed. Let's move on. And uh, Sam sent in another photo and this one, I I'm not sure which which one I will use for the thumbnail people out there. But this one is high on the list. <laughs> so we have Red Fox here, obviously. For the keen eye, you will see that this is not necessarily a natural surrounding. But since Red Fox are animals that are also living really urban, this was photographed in Sam's garden. And the fox, after some days, as I got it right from the mail, was growing in confidence and uh, was giving basically Sam here the opportunity to photograph the animal in perfect condition in his garden. Seemed to be, seemed to have been really patient. The focus is really crisp on this one. Sam wrote oh, as well, it feels nearly like cheating. <laughs> uh, I can understand that if you have so perfect condition in your, in your own garden. Uh, and this photo is also one of Sam's favorites from that season. Have you seen fox? You, I think you've seen fox cubs, didn't you? Yes, yeah, I have seen a few, but not at my regular site. Um, unfortunately, it's been a bit hit and miss. They do move earths, um, you know, um, from year to year sometimes. So um, I've lost out and being away as well, I've missed out on the key time for them. But I, I do particularly like this um, this image, you know, and it's, it's, it's the simplicity of it as well. I like I like the I like the foreground with the with the blue flowers there. Um, they're like forget-me-not types but you know even though it is in an you know in a garden I you know I do think that it, the fox looks very relaxed um, it's like he's actually yeah. like he's a friend and he's doing a little like you say he's doing a portrait for the photographer <laughs> and, and sort of standing still but it's really good because it really does stand out and I think the background as well has been is quite dark so he's sort of exposed for the fox yeah. a bit there in the background so I, I, think, I think that is and I think definitely the key makes it is the blue flowers give it yeah, a great it's real, real flower uh, color touch. Yeah, yeah. sticking it's out really basically great. beside the orange of the fox because uh, if I get it correctly, they are opposite in the color cycle. So that's a perfect color contrast actually from the orange to the blue of the fox, which is just uh, yeah. perfect. Also, I don't really, yeah. What I see now, uh, while while saying the the feedback to the last photo about the stone chat, that uh, maybe rule of thirds. But look at this photo. This is uh, at least how I see it. Perfect rule of thirds. The <laughs> the fox on the one yes, side and the flowers on the bottom third as well. So I, I don't have to explain anything to Sam about uh, the rule of thirds. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> no, I think he's nailed that one there. <laughs> uh, I think like 
The one thing that gives it, of course, away uh, that it's a garden. Okay, it's Seb saying it's in my garden, but uh, that stone slab right bus behind the flat stone slab behind the fox on the on the floor is the only thing that would directly for me give it away that this is a garden, maybe, maybe. And I'm just wondering yeah. if Sam would have gotten lower to the ground, would that stone slab disappear behind the blue flowers? What do you think? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Uh, it depends. I, I suppose if it's sloped down, I suppose, and you're shooting up a bit. Yeah, it's. Um, it looks like he's pretty good eye level, but yeah, that whether that would have, or I mean, you know. Yeah, it would be. It would be a trade off. It would be a yeah, trade off between uh, maybe removing that flat stone slab. Well, because that rock in the back is totally. Uh, I would take that as a nature shot at all, uh, in, in any yeah. uh, circumstances. But if he would go lower, he maybe would have missed the stone slab, but then he would be on eye level with the fox, I guess. So uh, it's definitely yeah. a trade-off, and the photo turned out really nicely. So uh, thanks for sending in this shot, uh, this shot uh, Sam, uh, and showing us what, what you were doing this spring. I guess we move on to the next one. And this one is from Steve Colwill. I think Colwill is... Uh, you're, you're from the UK, so maybe you can say this name better, but uh, Col Colwill? Colwell. Colwell, yeah, I know Steve. I know Steve. Colwell. I know Steve Colwell, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, I do know Steve, yeah. As we maybe talked about, uh, some of our viewers, of course, are overlapping. Uh, yeah, he's also from the UK. Since you know him, I don't have to really explain that to you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what we see here is a cuckoo. Cuckoo. Cuckoo? Cuckoo? Okay, uh, <laughs> correct me on that one. I've never seen one. Because in his mail, Steve wrote to me, as you might know, and I've, I've heard that they parasite other nests, but I wasn't sure about if it's exactly that bird. And on this photo, we see that the cuckoo is uh, harassed by a meadow pit. And uh, Steve explained to me why that is the case, because that meadow pit has of course uh, realized that uh, the cuckoo wants to uh, parasite the nest of the meadow pit and that's why it's trying uh, to bomb the invader with his uh, partner and try to get him out of the out of the picture <laughs> and even though uh, Steve first thought that this is a kestrel uh, he realized soon that it's a uh, parasiting cuckoo I'm still saying this wrong, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, cuckoo twine, it's, it's a difficult one to pronounce, but like you say, it, you know, it, I think, you know, initially people always think bird of prey when they see a cuckoo, but, and generally it's like sparrowhawk, but um, it's kind of, this is a, a great um, example for cuckoos. They, they do love to use fence posts as a, as a, as a point to sort of announce themselves, and, and this quite frequently getting hounded by pipits, uh, chats, uh, and, and other birds, other bird species, and uh, yeah, it's a particularly good little action shot there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have like the the other bird basically coming in, and uh, the cuckoo is on on the brink. Yeah, really, really on the brink of flying out of there. Um, now, that's uh, since I'm not a person that shoots many birds, and especially until now, not so many birds in flight. Uh, I love these action shots, and I wish I had time to do more of them as well. But I, um, I'm not so good with fields and finding birds yet. <laughs> but uh, I would have maybe enjoyed a bit more space on uh, the left and right on this photo, uh, especially yeah, for the meadow pit, because you have uh, you have the uh, cuckoo flying out in this direction, and the other one just coming in from the other side. So I, I would have cropped it a bit wider, but uh, that that would be my personal choice to basically have a, a bit more control on how the direction in this photo is going. Yeah, it leads the eye a bit more if you have got more space either side. And I think um, it's very difficult to get cuckoos anywhere on any natural, um, you know, natural hedges, trees, etc. They do frequent these posts quite a bit. So. It is a difficult one and they don't sit still for long. They're quite twitchy birds. So, you know, it, to get a picture of a cuckoo anyway is pretty hard. But like you say, a bit more freedom to move in the left and right hand side of the image would probably give it a little bit more um, impact, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if I see this crop, I mean, in general, Steve should have space if he wanted to. But in the end, that's your personal yeah. choice. And thanks for sending in your photo. It you works know. well. I'm glad to see a cuckoo because I... Honestly, I, I didn't know how they look like. I, now I can admit it. 
Okay. <laughs> so, thanks, Steve, for sending in your photo. Um, I'm glad you're watching and uh, that you wanted us to review it. Even though I'm, I don't think I told people that you would be reviewing the re photos with me. But since you know Steve and some of the other people uh, that sent in photos, I think they're going to be pretty glad to see that it's not only me, but also you watching their photos. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. The next one is from uh, Cameron Martin from the USA. Uh, it's from Eastern Texas. And uh, the photo he sent in is just made with his mobile phone camera. And I think that's really nice that you sent in a, f a photo even though you don't have an uh, expensive camera or any DSLR. Um, I think that doesn't really matter for this format because it's it's about reviewing photos, yes, but it's also about learning something about different environment somewhere else on the planet, uh, like I said in the beginning. Because here we see uh, the pink blue bonnet, and um, he wrote that it's really rare in the wild where he's from, so in eastern Texas, and it's apparently illegal to destroy or harm wild uh, blue uh, pink blue bonnets, pink blue bonnets, a bit hard to say for me, because it's the state flower of Texas. And if you wow. destroy, <laughs> yeah, you should pay attention to this now, if you destroy a pink blue bonnet in eastern Texas, or in Texas, you could get a large fine, actually. <laughs> um, yes, this plant has a really unique color palette. It's, it's looking really pretty. Uh, here in Norway, it's an invasive species. <laughs> I don't know about the UK. No, no. I, to be honest, I've never seen them before. Um, but it, you know, it, it you know it is a nice image, and it just goes to show, really. And I think some people people get carried away with you know seeing people with big lenses and flash cameras. But it just goes to show you with a mobile phone for things like macro and and you know doing stuff with dragonflies, butterflies, that you can get you know good images with your phone, um, and it gets you you know that unique position where you can crawl into position a lot more easier than you can if you've got a DSLR or mirrorless. Um, and I, th you know, I think it, I think it works really well. It's nice to know the story behind the image, especially about the sensitivity of, of them. But uh, yeah, I've never seen them before. But yeah, it's a great image. Yeah, I, th I think what you said right now is quite true. If you concentrate on insects and something, because a lot of people think, yeah, if I have a good lens, I can uh, get a more shallow depth of field. But one impact of having a shallow depth of field is also the distance between the camera to the object to the background. And if you for example, uh, would photograph plants or insects, you can also get a lot of depth of field through that basic trick. But uh, yes, I, I, I think that's... And their minimum focus distance is... I mean, you can get pretty close. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. That's uh, And you can get lenses for your mobile phones these days. Uh, thanks for sending in your photo, Cameron. Uh, and don't be shy to send in more uh, mobile photos and tell people something about uh, your environment. Okay, now so we move on from the blue bonnet and get to a bit more bird-like photos. And this one here is from Terry Roth. Terry is from the US. Uh, I know that he is quite a frequent uh, viewer to my channel. I I think there is there hasn't been a f video for years that I posted where Terry wouldn't write me a comment. So really happy that he sent in a photo and took part because um, I'm really glad that some people uh, that always write me a comment send in a photo because then I learn something from you as well because you always of course see what I'm doing but it's nice to see what other people are doing and this photo here is not exactly from spring but um, I think it's from uh, late winter but I think that also fits in because there is, of course, snow uh, in early spring in a lot of countries. Like, you've been to Scotland and it was snowing in May. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, of course, in Norway, in, in March, is even here in Kristiansand, in March is some of the coldest days in the year anyway. So, um, I think these photos also fit into the spring category. How do you like this photo? Yeah, I really do, actually. I mean, I think it's a pygmy owl, isn't it? It's a, bit like our, a little bit like our little owl here in the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous shot actually, it's certainly obviously just taking some prey there, I'm not actually sure what it's just had a go at, but um, it certainly looks quite large um, and I, I think it's quite a, it's a, always a tricky exposure for snow, but uh, I think Terry's done a great job there um, and the, certainly the, the, the eyes, lovely in focus, it's centre point of the, of, the, of the frame I guess, but I think that works well with the size of the prey there and it seems to be looking at something or checking its danger area, I expect. But it, you know, it's a lovely shot of a lovely, lovely owl. 
Yeah, yeah it's very, like, very nice. I mean, pig, pygmy owls, pig, pygmy owls, they're not so big. I mean, so to get a photo that fills up so well, that's that's pretty good. I mean, you can really, it's pretty nice. yeah, you can be really happy about that shot. Also, yes, the eyes are really in focus, so the important details here are really sharp. The prey does look quite big, yes, for such a small owl. Um, but what, what time would you say, Richard? What time of the day is this photo taken? I think I, I think they're um, di diurnal, so I think they're they're um, like our little owl. They'll they'll feed um, or crepuscular types that feed morning, afternoon, and evening. So uh, I would have said this is a probably a, a more predominantly a daytime hunter. I expect like our little owl, but yeah, it's, it's a it's a great shot. And I think, like you say, the good the depth of field as well, and the, and the detail in the rest of the bird. It's pretty sharp all the way around, so be interesting to see what settings he shot at. Um, but uh, uh, I sadly don't have yeah. the settings, but I can tell you that he uh, he told me that he shot it late in the evening. Would you see see in this oh, photo yeah. that this is late in the evening? <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Snow always, snow is leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, as you said, it's tricky mm -hmm. with the snow, but I think uh, the snow definitely. I mean, it reflects light. It gives you more light at night, for example, if you have a full moon. Uh, I think uh, like. Exposure wise, this photo is working really good for the time of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah good exposure on that, de definitely. Because the snow has a tendency, obviously, mm. to get, can go grey if you don't. Some obviously people overexpose the image quite a bit to to bring that out, and I think he's done well with that, really. Yes, that's, that's yeah, it's very... really evened out. Good, a good photo, Terry. Great let's photo, Terry. Yeah. One. Let's move on to the next one Great. that you sent in, yeah. and that's uh, Stout in winter dress. And yeah, wow. I would say this this must be recorded close to a cabin or something, or or from winter, early spring. That's around. Uh, it's, it goes the same. I think it fits uh, well into the spring category still. Um, yeah, I I haven't photographed stouts ever. I think I have. I think I've seen a stout once in Norway walking over a street while I was driving a car. That's that's all. <laughs> But since I'm so after the Pine Martin, I would love to also uh, photograph the stout in the near future. I just didn't find any. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, to be honest, they're quite an elusive um, mammal here in the UK. And, and we know, I mean, I'd never get to see one in its winter coat because they, they don't sort of ermine. They don't change where I am because we're too far south. But um, yeah, I've, I mean, that is pure white. It's almost kind of like albino. It's just, you know, it really is. But the eyes are... They're like glass o cherries. They're like so shiny. They're yeah. just um, beautifully, and it, I think it's probably in a barn or a cabin. Yeah. Um, There's still enough light coming in from uh, from the left side here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's kind it's, of uh, kind it's, of it's a gradient cool. still. Like it's not super strong. You have like the light predominantly on the left side, and then it darkens out a bit to the right. Yeah, I would be it's glad nice to photograph a stout. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the background's you know, it's slightly diffused as well, which is quite nice, quite blurred out. So, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a cracking image. Yeah, it's like, um, like the Pine Martin, they're kind of uh, still hard to find, but I think they're easier to find than a Pine Martin at least. But uh, I was out this Friday and I thought I saw a stout in a riverbed, but it turned out to be a mink. So, uh -huh. um, <laughs> I, I was like, so pumped to photograph a stout, but then I sent like a small video to uh, to a friend, and he he was completely like, "This is mink," because it wasn't so big. I thought mink are bigger, but it seems that mink they can grow still a lot over their uh, over the span of their life. So I, I was also fine with going out uh, yesterday, for example, and looking for uh, for the mink. But uh, that's that's what I get. I get get to see all the invasive species, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's invasive here. Yeah, mink are uh, an elite, an illegal over here, and they 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 obviously um, have to they cause major major drop in the um, water vole population um, yeah, over here. Yeah. Um, so, so nothing bad about yeah. the photo, but yeah, mink are invasive species here. But for me, that means I will <laughs> I will record it for my documentary anyhow because that's good te to teach people. Talking about uh, the mink and the stout, our next photo is from uh, Philip. And Philip, I'm already sorry, even though I speak Norwegian in a pretty good way, I don't know how to uh, pronounce your last name, which is I would guess bl bl I don't even want to try. I feel embarrassed. Yeah, but the the double double A is more like an O in Norwegian. 
it's like an old form of writing it. Uh, so I hope the Norwegian viewers will at least appreciate that. I know that, but you you have to send me a voicemail later, Philip, and uh, we have to sort that out. <laughs> so he's from Norway, and the photo we have here is of my yeah. Not favorite animal, but the fa favorite animal of my chase in the forest. <laughs> and we have here the famous ghost or shadow of the forest, as they say in Norway. Uh, we're talking about the Pine Martin. Have you ever had the chance to photograph Pine Martin, Richard? Um, I did once, yeah. I did up in Inverness Shire, up in Scotland again, because we don't get them this far south, unfortunately. But uh, it was at a hide, um, and I saw them for the first time, but I've never seen them in um, in the true wilderness, really. Um, a big one on my list, really, to be honest. I'm not one for generally hides, but uh, yeah, that, you know, what a great background there as well. Yes, um, yes. Uh, before um, we go closer to, into it, I have a lot of background from Philip to this photo, which I would first share with you right. so that you understand. But but I, I know what you're going into, like the background is insane. Um, but uh, Philip has first shared with us. Uh, Philip was one of the people I actually, I asked him if he would like to send in a photo because I know he's viewing from time to time and I love his work and I asked him to send in a photo because I know he's shooting the Pine Martin, he's shooting it in Norway. He basically succeeding at what I'm trying to do. So it's really interesting to have someone from time to time viewing that kind of does the same stuff, but it has actually success and can show us how something like this would look like. So the Pine Martin is a mustelid. I'm not sure if you say that correctly like this in English, but of course it's related to the stout that we saw before and weasels, badgers, ferrets, otters, mink, and uh, if not last, a wolverine. I always, I think it's always fascinating that the wolverine is just a big weasel. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> kind of funny. I think when I look at the wolverine, it's kind of like, it looks like a mix of, like, of a bear and weasel, kind of. But yeah, it makes sense. I mean, uh, Philip writes that, yeah, predator that can take hair, squirrels, rodent, insects of all sorts, frogs, eggs, and of course birds, because it can climb really easily up trees and uh, as some people that try to bait pine martens know they have a sweet tooth and uh, they're really fond of honey pigs and raisins so uh, this is the only photo where I actually have uh, information on uh, the shot settings this is made with a 28 millimeters uh, so I mean you see that's really wide it's of course it's a photo trap uh, it's at a uh, 60th of a second, ISO 800, just to think about that, this photo is a uh, 60th of a second, 800 uh, ISO, and he used two flashes for this photo. So there's a lot of technique uh, here to talk about what went into this camera trap. Um, I don't know if you did uh, camera trapping before, it's something I'm thinking about, but I never really got totally into it. Yeah, I've just I've just starting. I bought an outfit for camera trapping, but more mostly daylight stuff. But yeah, it's something certainly, you know, that certainly re reveals the secret life of some species. And I think it, you know it's quite an exciting venture I'm going on. But uh, yeah, that's a, a particularly good shot. Is that so? Was that a camera? Wasn't a trail camera? That was a. This is a uh, this is a Nikon D810. Uh, so. Uh, oh, yeah, that's quite a high-level uh, camera, and yeah, quite professional. I would say, of the photos I've seen today, this is like from the technique used. Uh, is this the most professional photo, the most advanced technique? Um, it's also the only photo that comes with a title. Uh, Philip called it the Pine Martin in Blue Hour, because now I wanted to tell you a bit uh, before we go on and really talk about the photo itself. Uh, tell you what Philip put work in here. Uh, he has been doing camera traps for the Pine Martin for two years. And as many people know, it's, you're lucky if you see this animal at daylight. Now we're happy in Norway to have long days in the summer, but still I can tell you the forest here is full of Pine Martin from the coast up to, I, I don't know how far, maybe Trondheim and then it gets a bit less. But it's still really hard to see them in daylight. And uh, what 
Philip did here is, he did not only photograph the Pine Martin, he also wanted to include the scenery, as you already mentioned, because that's something you directly put attention to if you look at this photo. And so, to put the scenery in, you of course can't stop down with your f-stop to 1.8 like this lens could. He shot it at f9. So to make a photo at night, this is in the early morning though, with f9, to include <laughs> the landscape, you need some ambient light. So this is from the morning. You can see the morning mist in the background. And it's uh, still the winter fur on the animal, so you see it's in early April. And Philip was so lucky that this is the last photo that was on his memory card. So <laughs> in, in all these coincidences together are just insane when you think about this. There goes a lot of thinking in this photo, which I love a lot. Like, he had more photos, but the Pine Martin was never looking at the camera. And the last photo, it kind of is there. So, so now looking at this photo and thinking about how much work went in there, I think this is, makes it even more impressive. I mean, not only to have the animal with a wide-angle lens, but then also the landscape. While you need the flash <laughs> and the ambient light for the background at f9. This is a really impressive piece of work, I would say. I mean, that certainly is. I think it's one of those possibly award-winning images you see that you think, my gosh, you know, it's not to get that all those variables to come together, to get the, say, the, yeah. the you know, the background, the foreground. I mean, the depth of field you use f9 was, I was just wondering what he'd used. And like you say, when you need the light most, you tempted to shoot at f1.8 so you could just get as much and less ISO and more but the image itself the quality of the image is is not soft it's not um pixelated it's it's done really well to get and it's nice with the old tree stump there as well and and the the moss like in there and looks like you got some some bit of conifer there um some of the and it, I think it's I just and the mistiness as well in that mountain the second mountain my my eye is drawn where the tree is and that mistiness it just gives it a really uh, alluring sort of I actually think this is going to be maybe a longer video than I thought, but uh, that's fine. I think we're not so... there are not so many photos left, I think. The next photo we have is from the bird dude. I will link his Instagram account. He's from Australia and he sent us a photo. It's some sort of um, pelican, I guess. I mean, I'm not sure what species of though, but I'm not really... Uh, it's, it's actually quite easy because it's uh, the Australian pelican. <laughs> <laughs> and they oh, only have oh, one, one, one sort of pelican in Australia, so uh, it's, yeah, it's the Australian <laughs> pelican. Um, and uh, <laughs> Bird Dude captured it here uh, while it was landing. And he says, while it's rare, uh, wh while it's a common bird in Australia, it, it's rarely seen. You see that the pelican uh, just jumped from this lock into the water. Oh yeah, the water is just moving, so uh, it's it's in in the movement that it landed on the lock and then jumped into the water. If I understood uh, uh, understood the email correct, ah, it's a, definitely an impressive bird. Um, I've never photographed pelicans anywhere, so I think I saw this bird once when I was in Australia, but I had only a short time and. Uh, I, I didn't have a good wildlife lens anyhow, so I don't think I took a photo of it. But it's definitely a big and impressive bird. Uh, I would be... Uh, yeah. I would I envy you for uh, having the opportunity uh, to photograph a bird like that. Yeah, it's, um, it certainly is quite a large bird, and I like... I certainly um, like how it's um, sort of symmetrical, if you like, from you know, from each side, it's quite well proportioned, I think, you know, it'd be hard to use the rule of thirds with this one, I guess, but there's a little yeah, bit there that, but it, but it's, yeah, but it's, it certainly is nice and sharp, and I, I like the bit that's entering the water, it gives you a bit of an impression, I wonder, keep thinking, wonder what the after shots are like when it actually went, did it actually crash yeah. into the water, did it actually step into the water, it'd be quite, gives yeah, you, gives what, you, what's um, happening now, yeah, you, uh, yeah, what, what happens next, if you like, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a nice image. I would have enjoyed a bit less of the top of the image and a bit more of the water, I guess. But it's hard to say what, what is in front of there. 
like like you of course don't know where he's sitting or if there's something uh, that he deliberately like didn't want to have in the frame there right that could also be the case yeah, yeah. So, uh, we, we don't know that, you never know uh, on a photo like this, uh, if you're saying like, yeah, I would have enjoyed it a bit lower, but you don't even know what's down there, so it's hard to uh, <laughs> really critique on that. And, then, and, then, and there's that branch or that reed running through the back there, you kind of think, oh, you know, it, um, but it, you know, you still got the main focal point is the bird, so, you know, that's... Uh... Yeah. So thanks, Bird Dude, for sending in your photo. And I hope you take part in another, uh, if, if there's a next video, <laughs> which there hope, hopefully is, uh, take part in the next video as well and show us some shots of your summer, uh, or yeah, yeah, summer, since you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you, you're of course allowed to send photos from your last summer. <laughs> the next um, is from Filippo Bandini and uh, um, he is living in Germany. Uh, he could be, of course, from Germany. Uh, the name makes me think that he might move to Germany, but uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, I know that he is located in Germany, and he was so lucky to shoot a photo of these woodpeckers. Do you know what kind of woodpeckers these are? Because uh, he didn't tell me in the email, he didn't know. And I don't... I don't know this woodpecker. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, it yeah, it looks it looks like um a lesser species of of a woodpecker because it's a bit similar to our lesser yeah. spotted um woodpecker. But because I'm so bad with Quite names, hard. I mean I know the species, but I don't know the name. It's a uh... yeah, it's um I must admit it's one I've um we obviously don't get. We only get three species here in the UK, um, but uh, it could be. Very well, be like a middle spotted woodpecker, possibly. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it, I think it. You know, it's because it's quite small. Um, yeah, I, I would say maybe middle spotted or something. I'm not sure whether that's. Um, yeah, I think they are found in, possibly in Germany. I'm not sure, but it's a difficult one for me because it's certainly not our species here in the UK. <laughs> but. Uh, no. But very small. Very yes. small. I think there are a few curious things about this photo, um, because what we see here is two males. Uh, if I'm not mistakenly about how woodpecker uh, color works like, but normally the male has more red on its head, but it depends a bit on the species, because for example the black woodpecker you can clearly see uh, that the male has red all over its head from front to the back and then the female has only a spot on the back. But I don't know, because for example in green woodpeckers that's not the case. There you have it on both spe uh, both uh, sexes all over the head and then the male has something, some more uh, red in the face. So uh, while um, Filippo thought here that those are two males, I'm not entirely sure on that anymore. Yeah, I think I think the middle spotted woodpecker, both male and female, have both got red on the top. Because Filippo wrote that um, at first he thought they are making out, but then he thought they are males that just young males that play around a nest. But actually, Filippo, I think this is indeed a couple. Uh, I have to look it up. Really happy that you got this shot of uh, of the woodpeckers and uh, sent it in because yeah, I haven't seen this. I have seen this species before, but yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. A new one, a new one for me. But I think possibly a middle spotted. But I'm sure someone out there yeah. who's a bit more um, well versed on birds of Germany could. There's always someone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's always someone. No, but um, it explains a lot what Filippo uh, wrote to me as well. That yeah, one stayed mostly in the nest, and one was uh, out possibly to catch uh, some uh, something to eat. Um, so yes, I think we're looking at a couple here. Um, that are about to at least build their nest because when I sent out to uh, ask people to send in photos, I think it was in March, late March maybe, when I first contacted you if you wanted to do this format. So it's already some time ago, and uh, they don't have young at that spot yet. So they're basically building up the nest, I think, and making themselves comfortable in this photo. Yeah, yeah. It looks like the tree in the background looks doesn't have much leaves on. It looks like a large beach or something or 
brought a horn beam or something behind. But yeah, it's a great little shot though, and especially, certainly the bird that small, it's um, you done yeah. pretty done well to get that. Hard to get close. I mean, I, I photographed the black woodpecker, right? And look how far I am from it. And I guess the black woodpecker is like, is it 30 centimeters at least, or 40 centimeters? Are they quite big? You had you had some remarkable footage so, on your video. Your yeah, your last your last one was good, really good. No, but I mean to, to get comparable so close to these woodpeckers, like Filippo did here, eight. is really impressive. Um, so good job done there, and thanks for sending in your photo. Next and last one, I think, not really the last, but the last photos that you guys sent in is from uh, Jonathan Graf or Jonathan Graf however you wanted to say it. Uh, he lives in Switzerland, but he also told me that uh, I think his grandma is from Kristiansand, actually, where I'm living. Uh, what we have here is another wet fox, and uh, as always, I'm envious because uh, I ha don't have the opportunity to shoot a red fox. Uh, and maybe a small story from my side to that. Here where I'm living, in this specific area, most of the red fox died to, uh, in Norwegian it's called scab, and that's the sictum that they lose their fur, and at some point they die from it. So I'm not sure what that is called in English, but... Um, but you, we call, I think we call it, they have a bad case of mange, they call it, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I heard that before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, especially here in this area, there are not many foxes left, and... Uh, I see them sometimes, occasionally, on my wildlife, local wildlife cameras, but they're really shy and they are not numerous. So, uh, of course, I would be glad to see foxes in the next years, but I don't have many hopes, let's say, and I'm always looking for them in other areas. And, yeah, Jonathan had the opportunity to not only shoot the adult, uh, the adult animal, but also a cup, which you will see on the next photo, but... Uh, he he gladly lives in an old farmhouse, as I get it right, so he was nearby the scene and this is also the first time he was able to get photos of uh, fox cups and uh, as someone uh, that is so eager, like in my position, to shoot red foxes, I'm really envious that he got <laughs> to yeah, photograph red foxes. I mean, for some people that might I don't know. See, does is it that easy to shoot red foxes? But for me, it's really like, oh, I'm looking forward to when it when it's finally gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a lovely shot, and I I kind of like the angle as well. I mean, it looks like the in the foreground um, is obviously a lot of grass in front, which gives it that kind of diffused look. But you still manage to retain the focus points on the on the on the fox itself. So. It kind of nice, really, and I, I like the, the, certainly the re relaxed or the expression on that fox's face. I don't know whether he's just watching yeah. something, smiling, or it's just getting a bit dozy. I don't know, but it, it it's really nice. It's very relaxing, um, and there's it, there's a quite a bit of blur there, but I think it works quite well. And yeah, the composition is really good. Uh, just uh, with that yeah. grass, it might have been a bit difficult to get the focus completely sharp because it could use a tiny bit more, maybe. Um, but I know how hard, that can be hard sometimes if you have a lot of foreground while the bokeh is really nice with the with the grass and everything. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, yeah, it is. I, I, think I don't know. Maybe in these situations, it's uh, if if you have enough time. Of course, I, I don't know how much time uh, Jonathan has to get this photo. But uh, if I would have had problems to get it tech sharp, I would maybe try to actually switch into manual focus. But it uh, always depends on your camera. I know that on my camera it's super easy. Yeah. I just uh, can directly move the focus ring and switch from manual to auto in really fast. So I would have maybe tried to even it out a bit with manual photos, but it's a really nice image and also nicely arranged. It works well, and I think you know his tendency. If you wanted to, if he was lay down maybe in cover, and if you were to pop up too high up, just to get that focus yeah. a bit more sharper, he would have probably lost yeah. the subject and then spooked it, and off it went. So I think you know it's a bit of a trade-off there. But like you say, manual focusing yeah, is good. Yeah. Depends on support, and you know you. But I think the light was pretty good. So yeah, it's a bit of a. But it's, as everything in wildlife photography, it's a bit of a trade-off with. I think you know you can't always think yeah. too long because he's gone. <laughs> But uh, it's a good, it works well though, it works works really well. Yeah, I didn't think about that because you're of course right. Uh, manual focusing needs a bit more control of the barrel. The nice thing is that you had for the first time the opportunity to shoot cups, box cups, and that's 
what we see here on this photo. And yeah, I'm, I'm really happy for you. To find a fox den in itself that is active is quite an achievement. Uh, of course, there's also some luck to it. Um, but since foxes don't really need dens if they don't have cups, uh, you can consider yourself to be really lucky to have found them. And then being out at the right time, of course, putting the time in is the achievement in wildlife photography. Uh, so I'm really happy for you to get this shot, uh, especially if it's your first cups and that you send it in. Also, a really pretty photo. Of course, a bit of bit of noise. Maybe he could use a bit of noise reduction. That's definitely possible, what I see from here. But uh, yeah, have to be also careful with noise reduction. Yeah, it's um, it's a good shot. I like. I mean, although the tr there's it looks like there's a conifer there, possibly a conifer in the in the, in the foreground there. You know, it, but I like. I like it. It's almost like the because it doesn't look very old at all. It looks like it's not. not no, it's not really long from from underground but i kind of like it if if you didn't have the tree there you could probably frame that a one one aspect ratio maybe you might be a little bit boxy doesn't give much room but i like how it's looking at that young shoot coming up um it gives it kind of oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's it's but it's so it literally looks like it's just popped up and it looks quite sleepy um but i, I really do like the shot and i say to see them that young i mean i don't think i've ever photographed them that young before so, you know, I've that, rarely that, seen yeah. the, anyone photographing them that young. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. No, so, that's uh, really, all like that gray fluff uh, and that yeah. Uh, yeah, face fur basically just kind of building out. It's it's that's that's a sight for sure. I haven't seen that in in uh, this early ever nearly. I think. But on the other hand, I mean, of course, you could do the framing different. But I, I uh, like how 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 it is here with the tree that you have. It, it gives some perspective and depth to the shot, of course, if you have a tree like that in the front. And it, yeah, because you've got size-wise as well with the with the size of the the fox cub and, and the size of the tree, kind of. It just and it obviously is very small, but um, it's beautiful, isn't it? Done a really a really great experience there, I think, to get a shot like that. That was all the photos for today for this episode. I hope I didn't forget anyone and for next time we maybe already have photos if I forgot someone. <laughs> Sorry already. Um, you might already know what photo there is left Richard but before we watch and look at that I want to thank everyone for submitting photos. I want to thank Richard for tuning in uh, doing this episode with me as a guest and giving his feedback on all these uh, nice shots. And uh, yeah, as you might heard, I asked one or two of you to send something in because I'm just interested in your work. And yeah, I'm just thankful for the support to make this format and I hope it lives on. And uh, now we basically have a look at our last photo. And uh, this came in from someone, most of the people watching this channel and uh, probably also watching Richard's channel know and uh, this is the red-breasted Bergenser, no, Mergenser, Mergenser, <laughs> um, shot by Tron Vespi. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm obviously a, a friend of Tron's and know his work well. Um, and yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I love it. Um, I, I love the foreground background, the glassiness to the foreground as well. Beautiful. I love the ripple at, ripple at the back. You know, I think it's nice that way he's framed it as well because you've got room to move where the bird's direction. Uh, I just, and the, posi the positioning of like, the saw bills, especially, you know, with the mouth open, you can see the serratedness at the top of the bill there. I mean, it's just well proportioned. It's such a lovely image. Yeah, he's a fantastic photographer. Yeah, great image. Can't much say much more about that than really. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I will not go too much into detail because I, I think everyone on my channel already knows what a Tron Vespi fanboy I am, but um, I'm gladly to announce that I have a message from Tron right now because Tron is going to be the guest on the next Your Best Photos episode, which will be about the summer season. But let's just have a look what Tron is saying. My favorite spring photo, I think that has to be the red-breasted merganser. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I was out in a perfect spring morning with calm water and I was going to photograph the combinator and the sun has almost risen. 
and had uh, the sun in front of me so I have some perfect backlight and suddenly the red-breasted merganser male uh, came in I was laying flat on the, on the ground I didn't have any camouflage or anything but uh, as I was laying flat on the ground I think it didn't see me and suddenly it came in and uh, a little bit further out was a female and uh, the red-breasted merganser has some awesome awesome cool courtship and it started to do the courtship in the perfect light condition and calm water and I got a really great set of images of that uh, so I think that might be the best uh, spring photo and the best experience that I had and if you would like me to have a look at your pictures uh, on the next episode of Gunnar's Serie uh, send them in right now so you heard Trond, uh, if you want your photos reviewed for the summer season by me and of course Trond Westby, uh, you should send them in and you don't have to really bother if you're an amateur, if you're a pro, everything is allowed. Uh, don't send more than two photos so that you're sure that those two photos that you want to be seen are actually selected by me because I just take two photos if you send more than two. Uh, so make sure that you send only two photos if there is like a preference that you have. Uh, if you like to send a voice message or a video message that's also allowed if you want to be seen on the video uh, to shortly explain in 30 to 60 mi uh, minutes, seconds, what you want to tell about this photo. If you're from the southern hemisphere like the bird dude for example, you're of course allowed to send in from the last season for example from the last year because spring is not the same time uh, and yeah just pay attention that the photos are not older than a year maybe uh, the info and email everything that you need to contact me and send in your photo will be in the description I will not take photos from Instagram like you can of course contact me on Instagram but uh, with all the crop on Instagram and uh, that doesn't work so good so just uh, photos over email uh, to end this episode, I really want to thank Richard so much for joining today. It was a real pleasure for me. And uh, Richard, did you have a favorite today? I did. Yeah, I think, I, I think you know, to be honest, uh, the one from Philip uh, with the Pine Martin has got to be up there with my, with my favorites, really. It really was a, a truly captivating image, and I can look at that time and time again and find something new to look at. But yeah, it was fantastic, and thanks very much, Gunnar, for having me on. It's been a an absolute pleasure to see all the work from uh, some of your subscribers. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, I was really glad to see uh, the their work just for like, I have some of them, on, some of you on Instagram, right? But um, it's uh, nice to see who wants to engage, who wants to show off their work. I mean, uh, you can be proud of your work uh, and we're all progressing. And I also have to say, yeah, the Pine Martin is high on the list. Maybe it's together with the with the fox in the in the garden setting. That was also a really beautiful photo. But of course, the Pine Martin is a lot of work that went into there. Um, if you viewers uh, out there have a favorite, maybe leave it in the comments. Let us know. Um, I hope you guys out there enjoyed this format. And if so, maybe leave a like. Uh, if you're new here, subscribe to the channel. Comment how to improve this format, uh, what favorite you had. And, of course, don't forget to check out Richard's channel, uh, his trip on uh, in Scotland and upcoming uh, videos on the Isle of Mull. Um, there is definitely a lot of content to watch on Richard's channel if you haven't done it by now already. Yeah, thanks again to you all. Um, best of luck with your photographic endeavours and um, just enjoy it and I'll hopefully see you all again. I want to thank you all for tuning in and see you soon, hopefully on the next video and that time then with Ton Bespie.